She's a smiley blonde. She doesn't look too dangerous. Well, I'm really radical, guys. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> I worked for 10 years at Elle and I was uh, really, really into fashion in a little immature way. I would go to Zara like every day. It took me some time to realize the uh, system was not okay. The fast fashion system to begin with. When the factory collapsed in Dhaka in Bangladesh, I think it was, I mean, more than 1,000 uh, workers, mainly women, were killed in this. I think we all kind of knew how it worked. Like, we were all aware that those clothes were made by people in the South Hemisphere and that they were really badly paid. But this event, I think, made it all very concrete and very real. Since then, I have never bought <laughs> any fast fashion. Um, but in general, also, I, um, I got uh, a bit angry with the fashion industry, even the luxury, the whole thing, and the way it works with the press. And I realized how uh, little freedom we had uh, towards uh, the advertisers. But, you know, when I started working at L, I remember um, sometimes my, my chief would send me an email on behalf of the advertisers. Then a few years later, the advertising section would directly send an email to me, like my chief was not even in the process anymore. And at the end, I received the email directly from the advertisers, which is like, no, not okay. One day I got a phone call from Louis Vuitton uh, telling me like, but darling, what did you do? Uh, our picture is smaller than the Chanel picture. And I remind you, like in this magazine, we have like five pages of advertising and Chanel has only three. So I'm gonna call your boss and tell, tell your boss I'm really unhappy with you. And I was like, uh, you know what? I'm a journalist. I don't care, that's not my job. I'm not here to do advertising for Vuitton. I'm here to cover the news. Like the thing that made me go, okay, you know what? I'm leaving from here. I had uh, covered this uh, trial about um, a, young, a young boy who had been killed by the police. And at nine at night, like the, the minute we were supposed to send the pages, suddenly my boss arrives with a furry uh, key chain from Fendi. And she was like, oh, look, there is this key chain from Fendi. You really have to put it somewhere in, in, your, in your pages. And she was like, oh, you know what? We're going to put it there on the full page. So I had to say, Fuck to my young journalist, to the trial, to everything that was meaningful to me in this story, to put a stupid Fendi furry keychain. And, I, and, and the ultimate humiliation was I, I had to write three lines being like, oh, Carl Lagerfeld is so cool. And like, <laughs> at some point you have to listen to your guts, I guess. And my guts told me to get out of there. Can you talk about what assumptions you think people make about you when they first see you? And I remember when I was a teenager, I bet he was like, are you a model? Do you want to be a model? Because I'm this tall, blonde, like, supposedly pretty uh, girl. And it was like, oh, flattering? But then, well, no, <laughs> I want to be a uh, president, <laughs> uh, a writer, a lawyer. Uh, I don't want to be a model. But being told, like, you could be a model was like the ultimate thing and the ultimate power position for a woman in society was like becoming a model. So how did it, that affect your like personal relationships? I, I, I really had a quite a active sexual life. I was the kind of girl you could hook up on the club and be like, oh my God, there is sadness in your eyes. And basically everybody has sadness in their eyes. So, but I would fall for, for this. Like, oh my God, he can see that I'm just not a dumb blonde. I had this offer to be on a TV show. Oh, I'm not really proud of this feeling, but yeah. I felt it was, it was really cool to do something that visible, that well-paid, that prestigious. But it was a nightmare. <laughs> uh, this all advertising, capitalist thing we were describing earlier when I was talking about Elle on television is like even worse. Misogyny on television is like, pff, it's unbearable. As soon as I arrived there, I said, okay, I know how to dress, ethical labels, emerging designers. I'm gonna wear only uh, jackets, shirts, and t-shirts. I will never wear a dress. I'm not wearing too much makeup, and I don't want my hair done, ever. I had a comment from one of the producer uh, saying like, uh, you know, on TV it always looks better to have a, how do you say? Cleavage. Mm -hmm. A cleavage, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cleavages look so good on television, you should try. And I was like, nope. Bye! <laughs> Women just don't speak on television.
if I talk for one minute, it was like, whoa, oh my God, I said so much. I, when I had something to say, I was like, okay, I'm gonna say it tonight, I'm gonna say it. And they were like, no, sorry, Lauren, we don't have time. I was a very, very bad, actually, television journalist. <laughs> I, I was bad. I mean, like, I was supposed to do something to switch to another personality, and I cannot, I just cannot do this. I cannot mm -hmm. wear something that doesn't look like me. I cannot talk in a way that's not me. Mm -hmm. I cannot say something I don't, I don't mean. I, I really cannot do this. And television is this. Do you think that you were um, chosen in the first place because you, like, looked the part? Of course, of course. They didn't listen to me. That happens to me all the time. They didn't get what they thought they were going to get. Exactly. Do you have like fears or anxieties like around not having that stable corporation behind you, or, or how has that been like that transition? Mm. I'm really not scared at all about this. I'm lucky because I have a family that can back me up. I have been really well paid for many years, so I've got some money. I have diplomas. Uh, I am a healthy white girl from Paris. I mean, I will never be unemployed. I will always find something. I'm not scared. I'm not insecure about mm -hmm. this, like, um, material uh, aspect, which is, like, such a privilege. Mm -hmm. I am totally aware of this. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about any areas in your life where you feel shame? I think there is also something about the women condition that is always shameful. Everything that's around our sexuality, our periods, I was our giving birth, I was our making love is shameful. Giving birth is like such a nightmare and it's not possible to say it. It was horrible, horrible. Tell, tell the story. What happened? Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not really comfortable with telling the whole thing, but uh, um, it helps other people, though. Yeah, it helps that's other true. Because by you're not being, un by you're being uncomfortable, you're being ashamed. Yes, you're right. Mm -hmm. I was huge. I was a whale. <laughs> I took like 28 kilos. <laughs> Were you fine with that? Yeah. I, I well, no, not really. <laughs> it was summer. It was so hot. No, at the end, it was uh, it was not not nice. Oh, I hated being pregnant, actually. I hated not being able to smoke, not being able to drink. Oh, oh my God, I felt, I was so horny. So horny. And this is something you should, you're supposed to be ashamed of, too. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's the shame part. <laughs> Watching video on new porn, which I had never done before. <laughs> I was like, what's wrong with me? <laughs> but anyways, I was pregnant. So, so, yeah, but I really was also wanting to get my body back as soon as I could. I wanted to the baby to come out really quick and not breastfeed. I, I was really wanting to share the responsibility of uh, the kid with, with my husband. And from the minute I had a baby in my stomach, like this is gonna be like a 50-50 job. I'm not gonna be the kind of mom who's like, have, has a baby wrapped around her body for two years. So many people told me like, why, poor baby. It's horrible, my God, bad mom. And I remember I feeling, feeling shame also on my own. Like, uh, I, rem I have a, an image of my baby being really, really young and smoking a cigarette like this in my pajamas and seeing the baby crying in the, on the little thing like uh, behind the window and be like, in the I'm such a bad mom, yeah. I need a cigarette. And he's crying, I don't care. And like, yeah. really feel like uh, ashamed of me. And recently, my kid, who is now five and a half, he told me, Mom, you're the best mom in the world. And I was like, oh my God, that's so cute to tell me this. Why are you telling me this? Because your job is so cool. Aww. And I was like, oh, thanks. <laughs> and he's proud of me for what I do. Great. Sucks. <laughs> What do you love and what do you dislike the most about French culture? We're the country who cut the king's head, and I'm so proud of this. Liberté, égalité, fraternité. Awesome! Don't change a word. And I also love French lifestyle. I think we got it right. Uh, the fact of sitting around a table and eat and drink wine. I mean, like, every single life should revolve about, around this concept of sitting together and sharing a meal. But, 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 um, there is this um, universalism in France, 
that makes it really hard to question some issues. Like on, on the American ident identity ID, you have the ethnicity, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it says if you're a Caucasian, mm -hmm. Asian American, mm -hmm. African American. Mm -hmm. Well, in France, that would be like, oh. And, so and you, you don't ever fill that out? No, it doesn't. It's, it's forbidden by the law. Because? Because we're all equal. There is no men and women. We're all equal. There is no black and whites. We're all equal. Uh, and, well, no, <laughs> we're not. I mean, like, uh, women are getting less paid and black men are being killed by the policemen. So, no, we're not equal. There is no statistics because ne we never we never count people. You never check it off. You never check it off. So, we don't know. So, isn't there's absolutely no way to prove that they're being discriminated against. But it's impossible to say this in France. It's impossible to say the word race in France. When you say race in an anti-racist meaning, uh, you get, they, say, they call you racist. So um, when do you feel the most vulnerable? Thinking about my childhood and my teenage years that is not, not okay yet. I was not a very happy little girl. So, but I don't know why. I mean, I haven't explored it yet. I don't know what was wrong. I just knew that um, um, I wanted, I, I had the feeling I was from another planet. And I'm not ready to explore this at all. That's why I, every time I start to see a, a shrink <laughs> after three <laughs> meetings, I'm like, uh, 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 <laughs> I'm not going into this. I don't know. It's weird. Look but at me. What I'm do you crying. think you're afraid of? I, I I don't know. Well, okay. I want to go into this what I'm gonna say right now, but um, <laughs> just mm, I had a sister and she died, mm. and. Um, I'm not comfortable with the years she was alive. I don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. It's too hard. Mm. Yeah. Mm. about why being in your body, in your skin, in your journey, why it's a good place to be? I, I really like being me. And I really like that I found a way to, to share what I feel and what I know. So, and what I know is that, is that every single life, every single experience has to be listened to, has to be emphasized, has to be celebrated. And we should stop like considering humanity as a mob or so that's what I know and that's what I share and, and yeah I'm so so happy to be able to do this mm. yeah uh, that was so beautiful this is my mom Elisa and this is my daughter Lily and we're the creators of style like you join the movement for self-acceptance by following us on Instagram subscribing to our YouTube channel and buying our new book